want to start out talking about um, what's underneath the skin here and why the uh, this roller skate here uh, looks so much like that roller skate there. Uh, this is 2015, that's 1989. Uh, you notice conceptually we haven't changed uh, very much about the car, even though we've changed every single part of the car. Um, the reason for this has nothing to do with us being traditionalist and everything to do with us having the exact same goal for the car every time we, we clean sheet it and redesign it. Um, the goal is very, very broad and conceptually very simple, but actually very difficult to execute. Uh, it's a big car that's fun to drive in every situation for drivers of every skill level. So from driving to the grocery store to driving on the racetrack, from grandmothers to race drivers, uh, everybody should be able to enjoy this car. Uh, and that, that sort of forces you into to certain design constraints trying to hit that broad target. Um, one, you, you end up with front engine rear wheel drive. Uh, that is um, <clears throat> the most sort of natural way for a, a, a car to drive when it has enough weight on the front wheels to, to have a good uh, responsive turn in, but it has a drive in the rear wheels. Uh, if we were just going for lap times, for example, we might do a, a mid-engine rear drive car. Uh, but it takes a certain amount of driving skill to be able to get the most out of a mid-engine car, and they feel funny. They don't respond intuitively. Uh, once you've learned how a mid-engine car works, you can make them work intuitively, figure them out, uh, but it's not the kind of car that everyone's going to jump in and, and naturally enjoy. So uh, front-engine rear drive is, is essential. Um, making it lightweight, low inertia, and keeping the power uh, low has been a consistent uh, part of the strategy. Uh, lightweight, low inertia, you know, make the car easy to, it's easy to make it respond correctly to what you want it to do. You can push it over the limit and bring it back very easily. Um, the low power thing uh, is maybe not as obvious, but if you want to tune a car to be neutral and balanced, it has to be able to handle, you want it to be able to handle consistently at on power and off power. Of course, you want to be able to adjust uh, the attitude of the car with the throttle, but if you have 300 horsepower in this car, you hit the gas and light up the rear tires, lose all your rear grip. Uh, and so in a, in a car that has a lot of power, you inherently have to tune the car to be less balanced when it's off power so that it can be balanced when you're on power. Uh, for me, personally, the, the, the point where, where I saw this, this line uh, uh, between having a balanced amount of power and having too much power uh, was when, uh, when BMW went from the E36 M3 to the E46 M3. Remember the E46 came out with a fantastic S54 engine that was like an 8,000 RPM, 330 horsepower monster of an engine. Uh, and it, it's a really great engine, but the, the, the car, they had to actually make it more understeering than, than the E36 had been, so that when you're on throttle and using all that power, it was then perfectly balanced. So if you took that car to a racetrack and drove the holy hell out of it, it was brilliant. But on the street, on a twisty road, it was much less involving than the E36. Uh, so that, that for me is sort of a, you know, a real tangible example of what too much power can do to the car. Um, <clears throat> we always had a removable roof and a road, so there's no mystery there. But if you go back to the, the basic premise that we're trying to make the car more enjoyable to drive, connecting the driver with the driving experience is what it's all about. And, and having, uh, having more of your senses activated, connected to the smells and the temperatures and the, uh, the, the, the environment that you're driving through kind of helps heighten the experience. Um, Miatas have always had uh, a relatively soft suspension, been pretty compliant, have a fair amount of body roll, um, and we've always had a double wishbone suspension. All of that stuff goes together. Um, one of the reasons that we keep the suspension soft is because we want it to be fun on real roads. And in the real world, the good roads are the ones where there's not a car in front of you. Uh, and that means that they're the roads that, um, that don't have a lot of traffic. People don't drive on them. People don't drive on the roads, they're not designed to get maintained. So the good roads are always bad roads. So we have to start from that premise that the car suspension has to be soft enough to handle well on a really bumpy, uneven uh, road, because those are the back roads where you're gonna have fun. Um, we also are not shy about body roll on this car. Um, body roll is one of the first bits of feedback that a car gives the driver. When you make a steering input, the first little bit of response is it rolls. So we want it to, if we're gonna have this thing <clears throat> have that really responsive, connected feeling in everyday driving, not just when you're driving really hard, when you're going to the grocery store and you make the lane change, you want it to, to have the natural roll response uh, to even that modest steering input. So we keep it relatively soft and relatively easy to roll. So now if the body's going to roll a lot and we still want to have great handling, we've got to have a double wishbone suspension. Because double wishbones 
had a lot of camber gain. It's a suspension compressor. The lower control arm is shorter than the upper control arm. So it swings through a shorter arc and pulls the top of the tire. So as the body rolls, it automatically keeps the tire upright. So you can have a tremendous amount of body roll and not have any loss uh, in, in a cornering curve. So we can have that roll without any sacrifice. Uh, so that's why we've always had double wishbones on this car. Um, and finally, the power plant frame, which is the aluminum thrust you see there between the, the transmission and diff. That's something we came up with for the first generation of the car, and every rear wheel drive Mazda since then has, has used this. Um, and that is actually a, a tool to make the throttle response better. Uh, your limiting factor on having good throttle response is actually drivetrain wind up. Uh, when you're getting on and off the gas, the engine mounts, and the transmission mounts, and diff mounts are called loading up in one direction and then kind of releasing in the other direction to get off the throttle. And especially the diff, there's a, a torque reaction. The diff is trying to turn the tires, and the, the, the diff is turning the other way in response. So it's lifting the nose of the diff. Uh, and you have to have mounts that are stiff enough to hold that diff nose down to keep it from moving a lot. And at the same time, it has to be soft enough to isolate you from, from the diff noise. Um, so if instead of trying to find this impossible balance of, of mount stiffness, we simply connect that diff to the transmission. Now if, if the nose of that diff tries to lift up, it has to lift up the whole engine. Well, we don't have to mount it very hard. Well, we've sort of contained all the torque reaction forces in the one, in the one unit. Uh, and at that point, then we can tune it for much sharper throttle response and get a much more direct uh, acceleration response from the car.